took a breath so that I could connect to my own body. I'll invite you to do the same. Nice. So I'm going to be talking about dance today, which means I'll be talking about the body. How many of you like to dance? Oh my gosh, oh, how exciting. <laughs> How many of you do something movement related? Maybe you play a sport, do a little yoga, crossfit, walk your dog. Oh my gosh, there's so many movers in the house. Very cool. How many of you have a body? <laughs> yes. OK, not all of you raised your hands, which is totally fine. But it's a rhetorical question, right? So we all have something in common. The famous dancer Martha Graham once said, the body does not lie. And I don't think you have to be a dancer to understand this. Right? We communicate a tremendous amount of information through our bodies all the time. How often have you recognized someone from a distance based on the way that they walk or their posture? Or maybe you can tell when someone's not telling the truth based on their body language. I see a lot of nods. Or maybe you've had that experience of tripping or stumbling, and your body just very quickly recalibrates and catches you from falling. I mean, sometimes you just go down. <laughs> right? There's these moments when your body kind of catches itself. And in these moments, the left side of your brain, which governs language, doesn't have time to communicate that you should put your foot out or bend your knee or reach your arms out for balance. Because it's way too slow. Language is way too slow. Instead, your reflexes and your sensory body is thinking for you. It's safe to say that the body is very, very smart. And I'm not just talking about the central nervous system, right, the brain and the spinal cord. I'm talking about the intelligence of the moving body and its ability to respond in real time to unexpected circumstances and situations. So let's just let go of this myth that intelligence is residing solely in the brain. And what if we started to trust this smart, moving body more, instead of relying so heavily on language and speech? How might that impact how we interact with each other, how we deal with conflict, how we deal with difference and disagreement? I do like to dance. I am a dancer. It's my day job. But I started dancing late. I was in my early 20s, uh, but I was a movement junkie. I rode motorcycles, and I did martial arts. So it wasn't surprising that I took to the physicality of contemporary dance. And one of the classes that I had to take early on in my training was called Contact Improvisation. You're probably like, what on earth is that? Yeah. So it is literally what it sounds like. You're in physical contact with another person, and you're improvising. So this form originated in the early 1970s, pioneered by dancer Steve Paxton and Nancy Stark Smith, who you see in these images. And let's think about what was happening around that time. What was the political climate like? The Vietnam War had been raging on for years. There was momentum building from the civil rights movement and the second wave feminist movement. So there was a real demand for more egalitarian social structures, for there to be more of a balance in power. And so contact improvisation fit right into this notion. Right? It was really challenging these conventional power dynamics. And it was offering this space where the expectations around gender, around race, could be dismantled and redefined. I love the physicality of contact and riding on someone's shoulder. But over the years, I've come to realize why this practice has stayed with me and how I believe it can serve as a vehicle for social change and for human connection. Here's three reasons. Bless you. <laughs> One, you cannot do it alone, right? Obviously, you need a partner. Two, you need to actively listen. If you don't, you're going to get hurt. You're going to fall on your head, right? Three, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable because it's unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. It's very disorienting. And from my experience, that is very much like life. And if we think about social justice issues and how we negotiate and deal with conflict, these same things apply. In order to affect change or to negotiate, we can't do it alone. We have to listen, hopefully with compassion. And it is definitely, hands down, 
100% going to be uncomfortable and probably a little bit messy. So let's look at number one, you can't do it alone. We're not alone right now. You're actually in a room full of people. And we're, but you're not exactly engaging with each other. Right? It's actually a very non-egalitarian situation. There's a power dynamic here. Right? I'm up on stage, the light's on me, I'm looking down at you, you're all facing this direction. This could be a whole other TED Talk. I'm sure there's one out there about power dynamics. So let's disrupt this. I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, maybe introduce yourself, and just engage in some brief, light conversation. What do you think about this TED Talk? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, you're ready to talk. So let's come back together. Or keep going. So let's bring your conversation to a close. That was so beautiful. It's like you've been sitting, listening for, for, for so long to other people talking. You're like, I just want to talk. So, in the essence of time, let's come back together and take inventory of your interaction. What did you notice about your own body? Did you have to turn to face someone? Did you reach out and extend your hand? Did you try to make eye contact or avoid eye contact or just totally not do the prompt at all? What did you notice about your own body? This brings me to active listening. I know you were doing your best to listen, right, while everybody was talking at the same time. But what about listening to your own body and bringing your attention to what's physically happening? Yeah. So we're going to do that right now. Maybe just notice that you're breathing. You took a breath at the very beginning. You just feel that sense of expansion as you take in a breath. And as you exhale, maybe feel your shoulders drop down. Maybe feel your feet on the floor, if that's possible. Or maybe just stretch your toes within your shoes, maybe just stretch your fingers, you stretch your arms if you want to. Just start to connect in to your body. Maybe you notice your nervous system calms down a little bit. Nice. So now that we're a little grounded, you feel the energy shift? That's kind of cool. Now that we're a little more grounded, let's dive back into this conversation. It will be brief, sorry to say. But let's raise the stakes. Let's move towards discomfort. Yeah, number three. Oh, it's getting really quiet. <laughs> so why don't you turn to your neighbor and ask them how they feel about immigration, right? Diego's talk, or LGBTQ issues, or capital punishment, gun control. Pick a topic. Go ahead. Let's start to come back. And let's start to come back. It's definitely not an adequate amount of time to have these conversations. I recognize that. But let's take inventory again. Maybe not just what you're noticing about your body, but about how you engage in the conversation. Did you notice that you wanted to push your point of view or maybe you were hesitant to really talk about how you feel. Maybe you made a joke. Think about how you communicate in general. Do you tend to lead? Do you tend to follow? Do you disrupt? Or do you just avoid confrontation altogether? This is the work that we're doing in contact improvisation. How do we communicate non-verbally on a physical level? So usually we start with ourselves. We ground ourselves. So if we can connect to our own and have agency of our own body, we are best prepared to communicate with someone else. 
So yes, by now you've noticed that we have some guests. <laughs> so they're actively listening, right? They're responding through touch and by sharing weight, but they're maintaining their own identity, yet they're very much relying on each other. They need each other to do this work. They're trying to figure out how to negotiate the space together. How are they going to share this space? Any negotiation requires a certain degree of openness and the, the ability to listen to perspectives that are different than your own. I refer to these negotiation skills as soft skills. Right? This is the invisible work at hand of confronting your own insecurities, of trusting someone else, and maybe having a genuine desire to evolve and change and shift. Touch is a transformative communicator. As babies, touch was our first language. We learned how to communicate through touch, through contact, before we even learned how to speak. Think about that. Our foundation is the intelligence of touch and movement. And now all we do is communicate through hashtags and emojis and <laughs> GIFs. Let me put this into another context, especially on a campus that's big into sports. Scientists at the University of Berkeley discovered that there's a direct correlation between touch and performance. So teams that engage in a healthy dose of physical touch, high fives, pats on the back, hugs, they tend to operate at the top of their leagues. Now, contact improvisation is similar to sports in its physicality, as you can see, and also its team dynamic. But the objective here isn't to win or to have a clear winner. At its core, it's about finding this harmonious and balanced relationship where both parties are sharing the responsibility. Contact is also influenced by Aikido. It's a Japanese martial art form. And Aikido is governed by the principle that you're not only trying to protect yourself when you're fighting, but you're also trying to protect your opponent from becoming injured as well. So within this combat training, there's compassion. Right? Instead of punching your partner, you're just trying to knock them off balance and disorient them, destabilize them. Contact is a destabilizing practice. It's all about falling. You've got the mass of one body falling towards the mass of another. Instead of crashing into each other, they're using that momentum to redirect and find a new pathway in space and maybe find a graceful way to kind of share that experience. Learning to fall into uncertainty is not easy, nor is it comfortable. We spend a fair amount of energy in our public lives trying to look like we have it all together, say the right thing, stand up straight, not stumble. But I believe that embracing uncertainty and disorientation can actually be beneficial, and that can serve as a necessary tool for helping us evolve as humans. And I think it offers a doorway into understanding and opportunity. I have often joked that if world leaders or members of Congress could do contact improvisation, that there might be more peace and harmony in the world. So I'll just let that image of Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump <laughs> doing contact improvisation, let that sit with you for a while. So it's a, that's a crazy idea, and it's completely implausible because there's so much taboo around the body and gender and sexuality. But we can imagine what it might be like if we trained physically and mentally to respect and trust each other on a nonverbal sensory level. I'm certainly curious as to what that would look like. And I think that we're all capable of enormous empathetic listening and that we're actually doing it all the time, but maybe we don't give it much value. So I'll offer a few invitations. I invite you to value the intelligence of your own body and to engage with others on a human level to make eye contact, to breathe, particularly when the conversation gets difficult. Another famous dancer, Liz Lerman, likes to say, lean into discomfort. So let's take her advice and lean in instead of running away. Because in that place of discomfort, you might just find harmony. You might just find peace. 
I want to thank you for your attentive listening throughout this talk and for sharing the space with me. Thank you so much.